from anybody so far. So we should be good to go. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, right. Somehow my uh, mouse isn't working the way it should. Right. So uh, Michelle suggested that I should put a picture of myself on the first slide. I'll leave that up as short a time as possible. Um, I like to start when I'm talking about likelihood and uh, the phase problem with this slide, which uh, shows basically a, an illustration of the phase problem and actually an illustration of uh, what can go wrong with molecular replacement. So here, if you can see my cursor moving around, is a picture of Jerry Carl. Here's a picture of Herb Houtman, and we all presumably know uh, their names at least. And if you take the Fourier transform of Jerry Carl and the Fourier transform of Herb, Herb Houtman, and you mix the amplitudes and phases, if you take the amplitudes from Carl and the phases from Houtman, you get this picture here. And it's like doing a molecular replacement experiment where you've used um, Houtman to phase the diffraction data from Carl. And you can see that if you have a very poor model, then you get um, a very biased map. <clears throat> but it also illustrates the importance of the phase and why it is that the phase problem is, is so important to solve. Now, if you have a better model, you get better maps than that. So in molecular replacement, which is used to solve um, more than two thirds of structures in the protein data bank, uh, what we do is we use molecular replacement to rotate a model into the right orientation to go into the crystal, and then to translate it into the correct position in the crystal so that when you apply symmetry, generate all of the symmetry related copies, you've got atoms in about the right place for all of the atoms in the crystal. And then you can calculate phases from the model instead of having to deduce them from uh, some experiment. So in molecular replacement, this works really well a lot of the time, uh, but there are limits, and we've been doing a lot of work to trying to push those limits and, and make it work better. So this slide's really a summary, a summary of most of what I want to say in the rest of the talk. So. Um, one limit is how sensitive the score is that you're using to judge the molecular replacement search, how sensitive the score is to finding the correct solution. And likelihood is the approach we take, and that Im improves the sensitivity compared to uh, traditional Patterson-based methods. So you can find a, a solution for a poorer model. Uh, quality of the model, the quality and completeness of the model, <coughs> so how much of the uh, structure you have a model for, how large the coordinate errors are, uh, whether there are domain motions, those can uh, influence how difficult the molecular replacement problem will be. Then there's, in terms of completeness, one thing I'll look at a little bit is how small the model can be and still expect to get a solution. Uh, but if you have a small model but you can add more pieces to it, then I'll show an example that shows that you get an improved signal from adding uh, other components, so that you might have an ambiguous solution for a small model, but then it becomes unambiguous when you try to add something else to it. A big feature of uh, phaser and the work that we're doing on molecular replacement is automation, and I'll talk a bit about why likelihood is good for automation. I mean, automation is good for improving productivity, but it's also really important for getting to for doing things that users just haven't got the patience to do, and for avoiding the errors that users make, particularly if they're not um, all that experienced in crystallography. Now, I've had a number of experiences, and probably a lot of other people have, of solving a structure by molecular replacement, or rather, solving a molecular replacement problem, but the maps are so poor that you can't see where to go. So there's a problem of the convergence radius of model completion. How bad can your model be? and still um, expect to be able to complete this, the structure. So that's something I'll uh, address a little bit. And related to that is uh, how you can combine molecular replacement with other information, and uh, that helps to improve the, the radius of, uh, convergence radius of model completion if you can bring in information from other sources. Okay, so I'm not going to say an awful lot about likelihood. If you saw the um, the URLs that were on the introductory slide, and I'll repeat them later, then there's uh, some pointers to some background material on likelihood there. But I'll just briefly go over a, a little bit of it. 
So the principle of maximum likelihood is very simple. It's that the best model is most consistent with the data, and in likelihood, the way you measure consistency is by probability. So we say, what is the probability of measuring the data given the model? If the probability is higher for uh, one model than another, then it's a better model because it agrees better with the data. So in likelihood-based molecular replacement, we have a likelihood target, which is the probability of observing an amplitude, structure factor amplitude you derive from the intensities given the uh, structure factor you calculate from the model, or the one example I'll go through in a little detail is uh, in a rotation search, you have a set of model structure fa factor contributions for the different symmetry-related models. If you apply likelihood, there are a number of benefits. Uh, one, sorry, <laughs> one big one is that uh, it accounts automatically for the expected size of errors in the model. So if you have an idea of how accurate your model is, then you put that in and the likelihood um, functions account for how big you expect those errors to be and how well you expect to be able to predict the data based on that. Uh, it also, in a similar way, accounts for the lack of completeness of the model. So if you know that your model only covers 20% of the total structure, you know that you won't be able to predict the structure factors as well. And the likelihood functions account for that. If you have a partial solution, you're building up the structure of a complex, then likelihood gives you a natural way of uh, exploiting that knowledge so that you take what you know already and add uh, some new information to that. And it also allows us to use ensembles of models. So if you have uh, only models that are derived from distant homologs, uh, typically you'll have several possible choices. And instead of having to choose one, you can put them all together as an ensemble and that will give you a better overall model for what's going on in your crystal. Or another application is if you have an NMR ensemble and molecular replacement works much better with that than any individual uh, structure from that ensemble. So here's the, the one example of how uh, likelihood targets uh, can work. Rotation likelihood function. So if we know the orientation of a molecule, so here's one molecule in a unit cell, um, but we don't know its position, what we can do is we can say, well, it, there will be this molecule in the unit cell in this orientation, and there will be a symmetry-related molecule in a symmetry-related orientation and other molecules, but we don't know their positions. If you know the orientation, then you can calculate what the structure factor would be for that contribution to the total structure factor, but you don't know its overall phase angle. So in this example with four molecules in the unit cell, we know the lengths of these structure factor vectors that come from the individual molecules, but we don't know their relative phase angles. So the angle between these vectors adding up, uh, we don't know that. Nonetheless, knowing the size of the structure factor contributions from these four mo molecules, then we can compare uh, that to the data we've measured, and it gives us an idea of whether the data is consistent with the particular orientation for the molecule. <coughs> so I have a an animation here that shows this. And in the animation, what it's showing is if we take the contribution from one molecule, and then we add the contributions from several other uh, symmetry-related molecules in the unit cell, this adds up to give us an overall structure factor. And as we translate the uh, molecule, uh, molecule and their symmetry-related copies around, then the relative phases change, and we end up with different uh, structure factors um, from the sum of these. And we'll see. Hopefully, the animation works smoothly enough on your end. You should be seeing this um, large vector with an arrow moving around within the probability distribution that's shown by the uh, shading um, in this in this picture. So, in the rotation function, then what we know is what kinds of structure factors we can get by adding up uh, the structure factors from the different symmetry-related molecules in the unit cell, we don't need to know their phase in order to compare it um, to the observed data. So if we change the orientation of the molecule, we change the length of these vectors we're adding up, we change this distribution, and then we can compare that to the data and see whether the data is consistent with that orientation. And uh, the way we do that is, um, sorry, the, the uh, structure factor that we calculate from a model has an amplitude and phase. And in order to compare it to this 
uh, structure factor amplitude that we've measured, we have to integrate over all possible values of the phase angle. So if we take a circle with the radius of the red circle here, then if we integrate this probability distribution indicated by the blue shading here, if we integrate around that circle, then that integral tells us how probable the amplitude corresponding to the radius of that circle is. And here it is on, on this probability distribution for the amplitude. And so on for the green circle with a different radius and the black circle with a larger radius, we see the probabilities of those uh, different amplitudes. So that's how we uh, construct a likelihood target. I won't say much more than that. Now, one thing that goes into this likelihood target, if, if it's a rotation search, it's the uncertainty of adding up the different uh, molecules in the unit cell. If, it's, uh, if we have a model that we calculate structure factors from, then that model will have errors. And the errors will determine how precisely we can predict uh, the true structure factor. And we describe the deficiencies in the model by a parameter uh, called sigma a, which is a measure of the model error, RMS error of coordinates, for instance, and the completeness of the model. The larger sigma a is, the better the, um, the, the more precisely we can predict the structure factors, and the tighter the probability distribution is, the lower it is, the less we can predict it. And before we've done molecular replacement, we have to guess what sigma a will be. Uh, so sigma a goes into this figure down below in two ways. The d is proportional to sigma a. So we take the RF calc and we multiply by d, and that's the center of the distribution. And the width of this distribution, uh, the distribution gets broader as sigma a gets uh, lower. So it influences this distribution in two ways. And as we change the value of sigma a, we see different distributions. The peaked one to the right is, oops, sorry. The peaked one to the right here uh, corresponds to a fairly high value of sigma a, and then as we lower the value of sigma a, the distributions get broader and move more to the left in this case. The red bar here shows what would the likelihood be if we said there's a particular f that we've measured for us um, for this structure factor. For a large value of sigma a, that would be a very unlikely structure factor, and we would say this is uh, this would give us a penalty in the likelihood function. Whereas if we thought that sigma a had a lower value, then that uh, observation would not be that improbable. So getting the right value of sigma a is important. If we think that our model is better than it really is, we, the likelihood function will uh, apply a penalty to that, um, to that observation when it shouldn't. So how do we get, um, this is one of the key features in practical application of likelihood in molecular replacement, how do we get this correct value of sigma a? And the way we do this is by knowing that, in essentially, there's a good correlation between the sequence identity uh, along the bottom axis here and the RMS deviation in the, uh, between the coordinates uh, in the template structure that we're using for molecular replacement and target structure in the crystal. This is a curve derived by Cyrus Chokia and Arthur Lesk um, nearly 30 years ago now, 25 years ago, that shows that there's a good correlation between these. And we can use the fit to this curve to translate a uh, particular sequence identity into a particular RMS error. <clears throat> and then from that RMS error, we can predict the sigma a curve as a function of resolution. So as we, if the RMS error is high, this curve falls off rapidly as you go to higher resolution. If sigma a is Sorry, if the RMS error is low, then it doesn't fall off as quickly. Um, in the last couple of months, actually, we've uh, been looking at a better way of uh, estimating these RMS values from the sequence uh, identity. And we have an updated curve, which is a bit different from the Chothi and Lesk one, but is actually that turned out not to have been too bad of a, a starting point. OK, so it's important to know how good your model is in order to calibrate the likelihood function. But it's even better if you can improve your model. And it turns out that if part of the model is correct and part of it is poor, you're better off just 
completely omitting the part that's poor, or at least uh, downweighting it by increasing its B factor than leaving it in. So we have a couple of programs that allow us to do model, model manipulation, which um, helps to push the limits of uh, what structures you can solve. This program Sculptor, it, with Sculptor you uh, give it a sequence alignment and then it uses that sequence alignment to trim the template. So if there are surface loops in um, that, so for instance, there's a sequence uh, insertion in the template compared to your target crystal structure, it will delete those insertions. Um, if there are regions that are poorly conserved in terms of sequence identity, it increases the B factors uh, of those regions, and it also uh, increases the B factors of surface regions because the parts on the surface of a model tend to be uh, the worst. And there's another program, Ensembler, if you have multiple choices of model, which can do a, a multiple structure superposition to make um, an ensemble for phaser. And something that's really turned out to be very powerful for some difficult problems we've looked at is that Ensembler can look at the ensemble and trim non-conserved regions. Um, parts that aren't in a conserved core are, are trimmed off. And actually, for some cases with models around 20% sequence identity, it's been very important to do this. Now, instead of just trimming, you can also do homology modeling, but you have to make sure that you use a really good tool for that. Um, we've mostly been uh, using Rosetta in co collaboration with David Baker's group. Uh, and in collaboration with them, we showed that in really favorable cases, an ab initio model can be accurate enough for molecular replacement. You don't even need a um, a homologous structure. But if you have a distant homolog or an NMR structure, then you can also improve uh, the structure for use in molecular replacement by uh, running Rosetta on it. Now, I'm getting ahead of myself slightly in terms of model completion. Another application to Rosetta is that if you have a, a solution, it may be ambiguous, you may have several possible solutions and you don't know which one is correct, um, using Rosetta, you can enhance the convergence radius of rebuilding and refinement by using the sophisticated potential functions in Rosetta and uh, um, the algorithms for exploring conformational space to uh, derive better models and improve the fit to the data. And this can be done when there's very poor signal in terms of density maps, so it would be very difficult to do it with uh, looking in CUT or, or um, running automatic, normal automatic building programs. <clears throat> okay, so one of the advantages of likelihood is that it really does lend itself to automation. And that's because if you want to do automation, you need, uh, you need to make decisions, and to make decisions, you need reliable scores. So likelihood, it turns out, is an absolute score that allows you to compare one model against another. If you have several different choices of model, and you're comparing them against the same data, the model that gives you the highest likelihood score is the best model, so you can you know that you can choose that one as the best. And we also know that likelihood should increase as the model improves, so if you make the model more accurate, make it more complete or more detailed, uh, then the likelihood should increase. We've got some new automation strategies uh, under development because recently we've uh, started to understand the log likelihood gain score that we use in phaser in terms of the statistical errors in it and what exactly is a significant in improvement in the LLG score and what's a significant LLG, but I won't uh, take too long to get into that now. But there should be some better things coming. So there's a lot of automation in phaser itself. The MR auto mode is what people will usually use to solve structures. That allows you to search over different possible models or ensembles. If you don't know the space group, then you can search over different possible space groups. Uh, once it's got a bunch of potential solutions, it can check whether they pack, because uh, sometimes something that looks like a good solution uh, actually packs very poorly, and you can eliminate it. It does rigid body refinement. And then if you have multiple components you're looking for, then it can um, fix one component and look for another component and bootstrap the whole solution. And we continually try to fine tune this whole procedure to um, make it work as well as possible with difficult problems. 
So here's uh, an example of how automation can solve a rather difficult problem. It's uh, a mutant of the ROP protein, which is a four helix bundle. Now we've got two uh, pairs of helices here. If you apply symmetry, then the symmetry generates another two pairs of helices. So you get two four helix bundles. But this uh, structure was actually solved by an amazing tour de force by uh, Nicholas Glicos. He has a Monte Carlo program called Queen of Spades, which uh, he, he moved four copies of a polyalanine helix around, uh, scored them for the fit to the diffraction data, and uh, looked for a solution to the molecular replacement problem. So it turns out this is a 23-dimensional search, and after months of computing time, he managed to get a solution. So it turns out in, in phaser, because of the automation features and the improvement of the likelihood score, um, we can solve this in minutes. And I'll go through this really briefly, but um, this illustrates a couple of things that I uh, wanted to, to mention about automation and user fatigue. If I was doing this by hand, I would give up at a certain point. So here's how the process goes. We have the first helix. We do a rotation search and a translation search. There are 24 possible solutions. The best one is number 12 in that list. It turns out a lot of these don't pack well, and we'd be down to a reasonable number of three possible solutions that you can't really distinguish from each other, even though the first one in the list is the best. Where I would start to give up if I was doing this all by hand is adding the second helix, because after the start from each of these three possible solutions and add a second helix, end up with 307 different possible solutions, and number 283 is the one that turns out to be best. So if it wasn't a computer doing all of this, I think I'd give up at this point. But the computer carries on, doesn't get bored. The packing search narrows it down to only 68 to pack. The best one is still way down at the bottom of the list. But then rigid body refinement of the two helices uh, cuts that down to 24 solutions. Some of these converge on the same solution. And the second one is the best one. And then the whole process is uh, fairly smooth and there's a good signal. So this illustrates how um, automation allows you to escape from user fatigue. It also illustrates how the ambiguity with a partial, very incomplete solution becomes resolved as you add more uh, components to a structure. So going from the second helix to the third helix um, resolves the ambiguity quite well. Now, in, in the case of this ROP mutant, um, it was very clear when four helices had been placed that there was a correct solution. But just as a little digression here, Isabelle Lusson wondered, well, what if you look for a helix and there isn't an unambiguous solution? Is there something you can do with that? So they came up with the procedure they call Archimboldo, which is named after the Renaissance artist that painted these paintings uh, like this one. And it's like building up a picture from pieces that are taken from a, a different origin. So you take a, a helix and you uh, place it, and then you take another helix, and in principle, take another piece of, of structure and add it up. And the idea is to solve uh, structures ab initio. So what they do is they use phaser to place uh, several helices. And there may be a very large list of ambiguous solutions, but then by putting them into shell XE, and doing um, density modification and automa automatic building, they can then find which of all of those potential solutions uh, is the correct one. Okay, getting back to automation, aside from the automation that we can do within Phaser itself, uh, there's a new uh, Phaser Mirage automation pipeline, which uh, um, is good, good for novice users because it requires only very minimal input. Uh, at, the, at a minimum, what you need is the diffraction data and a sequence file. And then it can go and compare that sequence file to uh, what's in the protein data bank. For a difficult case, it's better if you give a provide it with a good multiple sequence alignment instead of uh, using uh, Clustal W or BLAST. So if you use HHPRED to get a good multiple sequence alignment with structures in the PDB, that'll be a better starting point. From that point, though, um, Mirage 
fetches structures from the PDB, trims them according to the sequence alignment, and carries out the molecular replacement. And there are some new uh, features in it. So if you have a, a structure where the different components build up into something with a point group, so one of our test cases is a set of pentamers, then it can see, well, I've already got three out of five in a pentamer, so obviously there's a fourth and a fifth copy can be added just by applying the, um, the relationship between the other uh, copies of the molecule again. <clears throat> Another very powerful feature is alternative model testing. So if it detects, because there's a very good signal, that one of the solutions is correct from a whole set of alternative models, instead of having to carry out the whole molecular replacement solution, it, um, it takes all of the remaining models and just superimposes them on the solution that it knows to be correct and rescores them. So then you find out which would have been the best model without having to carry out the whole molecular replacement solution on uh, every single model. <coughs> so um, <coughs> I, I'll try to finish fairly soon. I guess I'm going to run over a little bit, but I wanted to end with um, one particular test uh, one particular structure that we've solved recently that illustrates how you can combine molecular replacement with other methods and how that allows you to get somewhere with something where molecular replacement on its own wouldn't be enough. So some of the tools that you can use, uh, you can use real space molecular replacement to place a model into an experimental map. So um, this is by cutting out the density for the map, uh, calculating structure factors from it and using that um, as if it's observed data, and that will allow you to place a model into that map. You can, on the other hand, you can take density from an experimental phasing map, cut it out, and use that to solve a different crystal form by molecular replacement. Or, in fact, you can use density from a model phased map, which actually looks a bit more like the true density than the model that it was derived from. Uh, <clears throat> the advantage of this is that if you uh, are going to be doing multiple crystal averaging between different crystal forms, the molecular replacement solutions, the rotations and translations, define the averaging operators. So it's very easy to go from uh, molecular replacement with density to doing multi-crystal averaging. And finally, you can take a molecular replacement model and you can use that to um, prime SAD phasing. So you use the molecular replacement model as a starting model and in phaser use the log likelihood gradient maps to find all of the anomalous, anomalous scatterer positions and improve the phases. So um, I'll refer to this as protein X because for intellectual property reasons, I have to, uh, I can't tell you what it is yet. <laughs> Anyways, this is a, a case of a fairly large protein where all of the models in the protein data bank have a sequence identity about 20% at most. And there are eight good choices of model in the protein data bank. And you can see from this superposition, they don't superimpose all of that all that well. There's a, a region of the structure that's reasonably well conserved, but then this the bottom of the structure is basically spaghetti. They're all different, and you don't know what the uh, what our unknown structure should look like. So initially, um, we tried molecular replacement with individual models either complete or trimmed according to the sequence alignment with the FFAS server, which uh, usually does a pretty good job of trimming models. And that didn't work. Molecular replacement with the ensemble failed until uh, we got this new trim option in Phoenix Ensembler, which uh, trims the bits that are different among all the models. But that was much later than uh, most of what I'm going to tell you, so we actually solved this in a different way. Okay, but just to illustrate that, here is a chain tracing of all of those models superimposed on each other, and trimming uh, prunes that down to a conserved core, which is probably less than half of the structure. <coughs> but even though it's very incomplete, um, this turns out to be a much um, a model that gives you a much better signal in a molecular replacement search than uh, the larger, more complete models. Okay, what really helped us in this case was that we had three data sets. There's a native data set, which eventually we got one that diffracted 2.2 angstroms. A gadolinium chloride um, derivative that 
diffracted if you're optimistic to 3.3 angstroms, but the anomalous signal is really only good to about 4.3. And a sodium iodide soap, which really has very little phase information and went, again, optimistically to 3 angstroms. The two derivatives are actually quite anisotropic, so um, they're not very good in, in a bad direction. <clears throat> now, in terms of doing uh, MIR phasing, we're hampered by the fact that these crystals are very poorly isomorphous. The cell dimensions differ by two to three angstroms. Uh, but actually, that turns out to be in our favor when we do multiple crystal averaging later. OK, so we hadn't solved the molecular replacement at the time we got the gadolinium chloride derivatives. And we were able to solve the substructure with HIS in the Phoenix package, uh, do sad phasing with phaser and solvent flattening with resolve. and you can see some features of the fold, but um, you certainly can't do a complete trace, but you can see where the molecule is. Uh, so I could cut out the density from that, um, from that map, and then by cutting out a sphere from the sad map, uh, back transform it to get structure factors and treat those as observed data, and then you can do molecular replacement of rotation search, phase translation search. And that allows you to see where the molecular replacement model should go in, in the crystal. But the resolution of the map and the phases are too poor to uh, rebuild the structure. So this shows the density for the, that was derived from this procedure and how the real space molecular replacement puts the model into it. You can see it's not random, but it's, um, it's very hard to see what to do with this map. Now, you can take that density, and because we now have a, a molecular replacement model, we have a better idea of, than, than just a sphere of how to cut out the density. So you can cut out the density um, to FFT to get the molecular transform and treat that then as a model for molecular replacement of density. If you do that, you get a very clear solution for the native crystal. And in fact, it, you don't have to do full molecular replacement, just rigid body refinement. Um, is sufficient to figure out the small transformation between the gadolinium derivative and the native uh, structure. Similarly, you can, we, we can uh, solve the iodide soak. So you can't find the iodide substructure, given the poor quality of the anomalous differences. But after rigid body refinement of the gadolinium uh, density map, then the structure factors calculated from that density placed in the iodide uh, unit cell can be used for the, this MRSAD phasing, where we say, where do we add iodides to the density from uh, molecular replacement to improve the agreement with the data? And that gives 11 iodide sites and improves the phase information a bit. And finally, um, because we've got the transformations that we need from doing molecular replacement with the density from the gadolinium chloride map, <clears throat> we have uh, rotation and translation operators to uh, do multi-crystal averaging. We have a starting mass coming from the real space molecular replacement model and starting maps. This is all done with the Phoenix multi-crystal average, average procedure. And by applying this iteratively, uh, we're able to bootstrap our way to uh, something to a final structure. So in this procedure, we alternate building with phasing and averaging. So auto build can build into the map that comes out of um, this multi-crystal averaging. Some manual rebuilding helps a bit. And then we rerun the procedure by taking the model that comes from building, do MRSAD phasing to um, get the phase information from the derivatives again, update that phase information, and apply multi-crystal averaging, and then iterate. And through this iteration, it actually, as the model improves, the substructure detection becomes more sensitive. So the gadolinium uh, goes from four sites to eight sites, two of which are split sites, and the sodium iodide from 11 to 13. And to make a long, longish story short, the structure is now virtually uh, complete. So we were able to get the structure by combining all of these things. So this sort of illustrates the ways in the different ways in which molecular replacement can be used in combination with sad phasing, solving alternate crystal structures, and, and so on. Okay, so this 
repeat some of the information that I gave at the beginning um, on background information. So the main citation for Phaser is this paper, and there are papers cited there. Uh, if you want to learn more about likelihood, then Erlie's written a paper called Liking Likelihood, which you can find from our webpage. Um, and here are the, the, the websites with different bits of information in them. Acknowledgement, of course, uh, Erlie is responsible for most of the um, infrastructure in Phaser and many of the features in Phaser. Gabor has developed the Ensembler sculptor and mirage procedures, and Rob did the updating of the um, Trophia LESC parameters. <coughs> Protein X is work that's been done by Michael Demidchuk, Ai Wu Zhou, Janet Dean, and Penny Stein. And uh, a lot of what we do is in collaboration with all of the rest of the people in the Phoenix project. And they're all listed here, the people in Lawrence Berkeley Lab, Los Alamos Lab, and Duke University. And I'm sorry I ran over a bit, but thanks for listening. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll take questions right now. If you if you have any questions, make sure you, you send them in the chat window, and you can you, you send it to the host, not to not to presenter. So just send them to the host, and uh, I'll moderate it for you. Uh, so I guess a uh, uh, couple. Uh, I have one question for you for the trimming of the model. Do you think the trimming of the model? Do do you also in parallel try to evaluate the models? Uh, individually and try to, to check if any of them would fit the data better than the others? Yeah, we usually do that. So um, generally the best results have been obtained by taking an ensemble, but occasionally if you take an individual model, it will do a better job than one of the uh, alternatives. Okay. And uh, <coughs> I have a question here for the audience on the average B factor for for a molecule. Does it does it matter what is the average factor for the molecule when you're doing when you're running phaser, or this is corrected once you once you run the computations? Oh, uh, <coughs> so that's a, a, a good question. So for the first molecule, there's not well, yeah. Basically, the overall B factor for the structure of the Wilson B doesn't matter at all. The B factor that you the overall B that you apply to your model doesn't matter because Phaser works in terms of E values. It normalizes the data. But the difference in B factor between a particular component and the rest of the structure uh, can be important. And actually, what we found early on is that some of the difficult cases we couldn't solve because one component has a low B factor. You find that easily. And then when you look for a component with a higher B factor, you can't find it. And since uh, Early put in a feature to refine the B factor for the first component relative to everything else, that ha actually has improved. So now Phaser is more sensitive at finding uh, subsequent components that have a higher overall B factor. Okay. And uh, I think there was a question also about a pseudo translation that, they would, they would, that I mentioned uh, in the announcement that there were some new developments with pseudo translation. Uh, that, that's something that I think you will discuss <coughs> in the Phoenix workshop. Can you very briefly comment on this? Uh, sure, yeah, that was something I trimmed out because I knew I was going to go over. Um, <laughs> so th this is something that we've been promising for at least three years, and finally in the last uh, several months we've got it right. So now what Phaser does is um, it calculates the Patterson map, looks to see if there's a big peak in it. If there's a big peak, it says you've got translational MCS. And then it refines some uh, parameters that characterize that translational NCS, including um, how much the two copies are ro rotated relative to each other. So it doesn't assume that they're I identical in orientation. And then it uh, takes account of that in doing the search. So if you've got one Patterson peak, then it will effectively, it's working with a pair of molecules in the rotation and translation searches separated by that translation vector. So it's become much more sensitive in uh, solving the structures of solving structures from crystals that have translational NCS. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the same time, there used to be a little program called lock rotation function. And, and my understanding is that in phaser, this this feature is not supported. You, when you do the when you know this uh, the self rotation function, you cannot search for two molecules at the same time. That's right. Yeah, it's yeah. usually somewhere. There's usually something that seems more urgent to deal with than that, but yeah, that's, <laughs> that's a, it would be a good okay. feature to have, you know, 
and sometimes you know what the point group symmetry will be once you've solved the structure. It would be could be useful to take advantage uh -huh. of that. We don't. Uh, one more question from audience. In terms of the interface to 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 phaser, because I think you can you can get the program in independently as a separate package through Phoenix as well as through CCP4. Are there any differences in usability, or pretty much everything is on the same, the same version nowadays and same features? The main dif difference is that CCP4 tends to be updated less frequently. So if you want the newer features, you'll find them in in Phoenix faster. Um, we we've been trying harder to keep the <coughs> the CCP4 interface code up to date so that you can uh, get that from us and then use the new version of Phaser from Phoenix within CCP4. Um, but apart from that, the frequency of updates, it's the same program. We try really hard to make all of the features available through both interfaces. Right. And how often do you update in general? How many releases per year? Uh, <laughs> CCP4 tends to be released about every second year, and they're really trying hard to improve that. Phoenix for Phoenix, Phoenix for Phoenix. Phoenix for, 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 for is Fraser. There's, there's for probably Fraser. two major major releases of Phoenix per year, but if you like to live on the edge, there's a nightly build most nights. <laughs> <laughs> right. so, so every night, um, the current version of Phaser and all the other programs are downloaded and it's built. And if it passes some tests, then a nightly build is made available. Okay. So the but the Phaser is updated as as often as well, right? Or yeah, yeah. So whatever we've put into our SVN um, repository, pretty much. that that goes into the nightly build. So if you find a bug and you report it, uh, <laughs> then very frequently you can get the fixed version the next day. Okay, that, that's excellent. Any upcoming uh, workshops, conferences you would recommend to participants, uh, or you will be presenting? Oh well, it's too late to apply for RHA. That would be a very good meeting. Um, <laughs> Let's see. The well, the there's the CCP4 workshop at, at the APS where um, there will be people. There will be some presentations on Phaser and Phoenix, I believe. Um, Gordon Conference. Gordon Conference is an excellent meeting. That's coming up in the end of July. Early will be there. Okay. Great. I I think that those are. Uh, no more questions. It was very, very uh, popular webinar. We have uh, over 60 people participating, so uh, certainly a lot of interest in molecular replacement. And uh, thank you, thank you very much for for presenting, and thank you everybody for participating. And uh, we'll go back to our regular duties. And uh, thank you again. Goodbye. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye.